Heather's talk is on what living with a quality mind in an ordinary world. Heather, while we're getting our um, technical difficulties overcome, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, actually, that was my first slide, but uh, oh. that's okay. <laughs> So I've been a volunteer with PNSQC. I don't know if everybody can see me or not. Um, I've been a volunteer with PNSQC for about the last 10 years. Oh, there I am. Um, and I started life as an anthropologist and then decided I didn't want to participate in that sport anymore. And after I got out of anthropology, I looked at my skill set and thought, well, maybe the computer thing will go somewhere. So that was 27 years ago. So uh, I've been doing this the whole time. I've been, I work primarily with startups. So I've done a lot of weird jobs. I, I've done QA, I've done tech support. I've been a sales engineer. I've been an IT manager. Um, I've been a building manager. Whatever they needed to me to do is what I've been doing. So as a result, and given my anthropology background, it's given me sort of an interesting perspective um, going through the world. So is there any shot of getting the chat posted for a second up on the screen. If that's possible, that would be great. If not, we'll, we'll live with it. Let's see if I can figure out how to run this. Oh, there we go. Oops. Where's the chat? I need to do it here. Bill would be monitoring the chat. Okay, it's not a big deal. I may need Phil to play along, play the yeah. home game with me. <laughs> You guys keep going. I'm yeah. just uh, hanging out. I'm going to put my slides back on the screen. Okay. So yeah, there's me riding my horse. Um, anyway, uh, and actually currently I am a staff engineer on the quality control team for NWEA, which is sort of an in-house think tank. It's my job to think about ways to make everybody else's lives more difficult and or interesting, depending on what your viewpoint point is. So anyway, um, I've been holding a theory for a long time, and this is my chance to, to prove it a little bit. Um, and this is where I need you to pay attention to the chat, Phil. Um, of the people out there, how many of you are quality professionals? Just type yes into the window. And uh, if you're not, if you don't consider yourself a quality professional, and you're just here for the free food and the fun, just type no into the window. And I'm curious to see how many, how many no's we get and how many yeses we get just on average. Are we getting a lot of one or the other? A lot of quality professionals? Uh, Other people went for yes. Okay. And then one person went for quality professional. Okay, <laughs> cool. I just was kind of gauging my room, which is difficult in, 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 the, in the internet space. But anyway, um, of those folks that are quality professionals, how many of you have a hard science or hard tech degree, like IEEE, CIS, math, anything that would be considered a, a natural uh, entry into technology? Couple, how many in the chat? Math, CS degree, business. Okay, so that's my next question. How many of you have a non-traditional entry into technology uh, and into quality actually? Anthropology, biology, English, business. I'm guessing there's quite a few. Susan is uh, international business. Okay. So the reason I asked this question is because I think that influences who does what, what thing, you know, where, where your interest in life kind of drive whether or not you become a quality professional. So this is stuff that I've heard said about me over the years <laughs> with my dad one day. He says, why do you always see all the stuff that could go wrong? We were driving in the truck and I was like, do you think the tire is going to go flat? Because we were on a bumpy road. Um, I had a dev manager years ago who was not awesome, but he said to me, why are you always so negative about our software? Well, you pay me, but other than that, um, I, I'm a coach on an equestrian team and they like to call me the dream killer. They come up with ideas and I proceed to shoot holes in them. So again, and then my husband will tell people that I'm a pessimist, even though actually I firmly believe that everything is doable with enough effort. I'm actually kind of an optimist, but I also don't believe in perfection. So 
So yeah, some of this is personal and some of it is a lot of the people I've worked with over the years have proven my little theory. But there are two kinds of brains in technology. There's probably more, um, but, but I'm generalizing a little bit. And the nice grid on the right, that's how developers think about the world. For them, it's very organized, very logical, very, you know, one thing leads to another. And then there's the QA guy in the room who's scribbling all over the paper. We don't stay in the lines. It's not our job to stay in the lines. And if we're good at our jobs, we definitely don't think in the lines. Um, the best example I have of this, years ago, a friend of me asked, a friend of mine asked me to QA a little website he was building for a university. It was for uh, a lab class. The students put their entries in and they hit the submit button. And that was the recording of their lab results. He gave me the software and I played with it. And then he checked, 10 minutes later, he said, why? do you have your answer in there 57 times? And I said, well, I clicked the submit button and nothing happened. And this is my grade. So I want to make sure you get my, my information. So I clicked until it wouldn't click anymore. <laughs> the difference is he's the one that coded the software and he was absolutely positive that it was going to work. So he didn't think we needed an acknowledgement that the data went through. And I said, as a student, I want to make sure you know that I did my, my lab. So you need to pop up some sort of a message to tell people that, you know, the grade got recorded. And that's the difference. In his mind, he trusted himself and he was very organized and very thoughtful. And I just went in and made a big old mess of the thing. And that's kind of what makes a good tester. So beyond us, I wanna kind of jump around. I think there's some support for this in the animal world. Um, if, you, if you've ever met anybody that owns a Mustang, um, if you look at Mustang herd dynamics, when a herd crosses an area, there's always one in front and that's the lead mare. And she's the watch mare. It's her job to make, to basically keep an eyeball and make sure that there are no predators to be seen. Interestingly, the rest of the herd comes through and then the stallion's in the back and he serves a couple purposes. One purpose is obvious. The other purpose is um, basically clickbait for predators. He's there to get, get taken down so that his, his genetics live on because that's what his mares are for. Anyway. Um, the watch mare, progeny of a watch mare are really interesting. We actually have one in our barn. Um, he's a gelding, but every day he spooks at the haystack. And the reason why he spooks at the haystack is that every day that haystack changes because I take hay off of it. But he is so observant that, you know, oh my God, there's three bales missing. It, the world is different. So we're really, we're quite positive that he is the offspring of a watch mare. Oh, you're fine. Um, and if you talk to other people in the Mustang world, they'll tell you the same thing, you know, well, I got, I've, I've got the offspring of a, of a, of a watch mirror. I can't, you know, I have to be careful where I ride because my horse is always going sideways. Um, mountain gorillas, something similar, uh, silverback males protect and lead the group. Leadership within the silverback mountain herd always falls to the sons or almost always falls to the sons of the silverback. Now you can argue whether it's nature or nurture, but there's a lot of belief that it's, it's hardwired, that if your father was uh, a silverback, you inherited those, those same tendencies and instincts. Um, and again, guardian animals, llamas, donkeys, and livestock guardian dogs. Those animals are gen genetically predisposed and bred for protest protective instincts. It's really interesting. If you, if you turn a donkey out with a herd of sheep, that donkey will stay with that herd of sheep. And if something comes in, God help it, because it's not going to last long. Um, stay with livestock guardian dogs and llamas. They bond with their herd, and they are genetically predisposed to take care of those animals. And they do it. If you throw a livestock guardian puppy in at, at six weeks old, it'll curl up with the sheep and go to sleep. That's just how it thinks. So I'd like to think that I'm not... Uh, off base too much. Uh, and that's the story. Quality people, to be good at our jobs, we have to think differently than engineers do. We're born natural troubleshooters and lookers for trouble. Um, we're also very chaotic thinkers. You know, we get up in the morning and we think about how am I going to break things today? Um, and like I said here, it's, it's instinctual. We cannot help ourselves. This chases me through life every day. Everything I do, even if it has nothing to do with work, I'm looking for where it's gonna go sideways. If I'm working on a project for myself 
Like, where can this go wrong? Why will this not work? You know, how can I break this? Um, and just like in a herd, if you go back into the, the primal, uh, the primal condition, you know, hominids on the plains, you have to have that one guy that's making sure that the rest of the group is, is safe. And we, you know, we know from, from the, the archeological history that humans have been in groups for millions and millions of years. So it makes sense that some of us are just genetically programmed to be the watchers. And, you know, 400,000 years ago, it was watching for predators. Today, it's watching for bad software is how it manifests itself. So, anyway, um, questions, anyone? Yes. So I think of Bernie Sanders as being a critic. Mm -hmm. How do you go from being an observer and a critic to, to dominating a discussion? So I agree with some things, I don't agree with other things, but mm -hmm. he observed a lot of the things that's broken mm -hmm. in our world mm -hmm. and it just, it dominates the conversation. Mm -hmm. So in a software development world, if you're always looking for things that break sometimes you affect schedules and you affect price. Mm -hmm. And if you're with a startup, you only have a limited budget. Yes. So how do you juggle those things? Well, um, I, would, I would argue that it's not necessarily for the quality engineer to juggle those things. It's for the quality engineer to present the information and to present the menu of choices and for those above them to make that decision. You know, I've been toe to toe with the VP of engineering saying, you know, look, if we ship this thing, we're gonna have unhappy customers. You can, if you want that, go for it, but I'm not putting my name on it. Yeah, a comment and a question. Um, since you're an anthropologist, I think you appreciate this. Uh, you know, you said you're a natural pessimist, but yeah. I, I challenge that because uh, if you watch uh, like the John Woo classic movies, you know, uh, with uh, Tony Platt and those guys, when it can't get any worse in terms of the tragic nature of the plot, uh -huh. it got more tragic. Yeah. So, so I, I think this notion of pessimism is tied, highly tied to cultural backgrounds. And I think Americans, no matter how pessimistic, are naturally very optimistic. Right? Yes. So, so I challenge your viewer that you are a pessimist. Actually, I believe I'm an optimist. Yeah, there you go. But everybody around me thinks that I'm a pessimist because I'm constantly shooting their information, their stuff down. But I, be, I believe that I believe that with enough work, anything is possible. But I also don't believe in perfection. Yes, and, and I appreciate that because uh, for quality management or otherwise, I think the uh, just when you things can't get worse, it could get worse. Yes. So some of us that have been involved in total disasters of projects, so some folks in this room know which ones I'm talking about. So <laughs> thank you. Oh, absolutely. Do we have anything from? Let's do. Notice the comment that testers are natural workers for trouble. Yes, 127.5%.